Well, it is an honor to be with you. My name's Matt Carter. I'm the guy that started this church about 15 years ago. And uh, by the way, it is our 15 year anniversary this year. It just kind of hit me a couple. Yeah, you can clap for that. That's pretty cool. Um, our church is um, the same age as my middle daughter. She had just been born when we moved here. And so um, welcome to your teenage years. We're 15, right? We're adolescents and uh, our wisdom uh, is about that level. And so be, be patient with us. Hey, listen, I wanna, I wanna address, um, I don't do this often, I'm gonna do it today. I wanna address yesterday, if you, if you weren't on Twitter, weren't paying attention to the news, um, there was a, an event that happened 24, 48 hours ago. There was a rally in Charlottesville uh, where a group of white supremacists, um, I don't, I don't under, quite understand the whole alt-right thing or whatever, so I don't, I don't know about all that, but they were basically a group of white supremacists that came out. Um, they were protesting the removal of a Robert E. Lee statue or something, and, and it just got real ugly real fast, and, and uh, there was some violence. Um, I, they, I think a car ran into some of the counter-protesters. Some people were killed, and, and we just felt like it was appropriate for us to just take a second, and we just want you to know where we stand as a church, the leadership, uh, the elders. Um, we, we stand in solidarity, opposed completely 100% as a church to any form of racism as it exists in this country. There, there, is, there is not a message that could not be more contrary to the gospel than racism. Jesus loves every person, every tribe, every tongue. We will all be different colors and races standing around the throne of God. If you don't like uh, diversity, you're not gonna like heaven very much. And, it, and as far as the white supremacy thing, which is one of the most satanic things that's ever been uttered, um, there is only one person and that, that has ever been supreme and every will be supreme, and he's a Middle Eastern Jew named Jesus Christ. And we will all be bowing before him one day. And so I just, not trying to get political, just want you to know where we stand as a church. We are fighting in this church um, and praying through actively what it looks like for us to be a more racially diverse church. I just want you to know we're thinking about it. It's on our radar. We care about it deeply, all right? That's all I'm gonna say about that. So I want you to open up your Bibles to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 26. And I was gonna see if one of you worship dudes could throw me some water. My, my, my mouth is really dry. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, Tatry. All right. So, um, Matt, or not, excuse me, not Matthew. First Corinthians chapter 12, verse 26. We're going to get there in a minute. We are beginning today a series that we're uh, starting today. It's going for several weeks, and we're calling it Convictions. And um, what we're doing in this series, and, and we're going to be teaching it for a few weeks, we're talking about kind of the core principles um, or the core convictions that our church was built on. The core convictions, the core biblical principles that our church was built on, and we're doing it for a couple reasons, and, and here's the first one. Number one is that, statistically speaking, there is a pretty large percentage of you that are here, even today, that are visitors. And over the next couple of weeks, they'll be here, will be, uh, will be visitors. And there's also an even larger percentage of you that you started coming to the Austin Stone probably in the last couple of years, and if somebody were to ask you the question, <clears throat> you know, what is the Austin Stone all about? You know, what are they about? I think we'd get a lot of different answers. I think we, we might even get hundreds of different answers if you were to have to answer that question, kind of what are the core principles or the core convictions of this church? And so we want you to be able to know if you're gonna come to this church, be a part of this body, engage, serve, build your life here with us, we want you to know what we stand for. And that's what this is about, the series. And so the second reason that we're doing this is, is, is basically this, I think it's important that every once in a while, especially in your walk with Christ, that you take some time in your life to kind of get back to the basics of Christianity, get back to the basics of what it looks like to just be a follower of Christ. And I wanna give you an illustration, and I wanna warn you guys, I've, I don't think I've ever done this in the history of my preaching, but I'm gonna give you two illustrations today um, on different points that are completely sports related and I just deeply apologize for that. So would you please forgive me for that, but it's coming, right? I don't do that often if you're new here to the church. <clears throat> but some of you, here, illustration about why it's important to get back to the base. Some of you may know that in my spare time, in the evenings, I coach football for Veritas Academy. I'm the offensive coordinator. And um, I, I, I started on varsity two years ago and we were a really good team. We had a lot of talent. 
And we ended up winning state that year. We went undefeated 13-0. and And it has a whole lot less to do with like our ability as coaches or even really the players. They were excellent. But we played an incredibly easy schedule. And true story, for those of you who know football, my offense got stopped three times all season. I punted three times. That's how good we were and that's how bad the competition was. But we still walked away from that state championship thinking we're awesome. We're the greatest six-man football team in, this, in, in Texas history, right? And so the next year came around and my coach, our head coach wanted some, uh, he wanted some, a challenge, and so he scheduled three public school teams. I don't know if you know this, but in West Texas, there's a ton of public school six-man football teams, and he scheduled the top three uh, Texas six-man football teams in the state of Texas. Long story short, we went 0-3 to start that season, and we just got murdered. We got murdered, and and so it was the bye week after that third um, third week of losing three in a row. And I, I was in counseling. I didn't preach that week, and so, um, but we... We were deciding, all right, what are we going to do with these kids? We're 0-3, the season's not starting right. And so we decided that what we needed to do was go back to the basics. And so instead of teaching these guys some complicated football scheme, we, we literally came back that first Monday and, and we're like, okay, this, this is how you catch a football, right? This is how you throw a football. This is how you block, right? This, this is how you, you get in a three-point stance. We went back to the basics. We just taught the fundamentals of football and we just built on that and went from there. Well, long story short, we went on 11-0 run. We won state again. So maybe I am a brilliant coach. We're not sure. But anyway, that's kind of where we're at as a church, that's kind of where we're at as, as a church. I think that in many ways, if you will, forgive the illustration, we, we have a good record as a church in the first 15 years of our existence. You may not know this, but you are known all over the country for a lot of things. The Austin Stone is known for its, its missions. People know around the world that our church has almost 200 folks that are, that are around the country in foreign missions. They're known for, we're known for our worship. Everybody in, the, in America knows who Aaron Ivey is and they, they love him and they listen to this band's music and, and all of our band's music. We're known for our leadership development. Kevin Peck, our lead pastor, is one of, the, one of the top kind of leadership development thinkers in the country. You don't know that, but he is. And so we have this record and I think it'd be very easy for us to kind of just sit back and say, hey, God's done some great stuff in us over the last 15 years and kind of rest on our laurels. But the question that I think this series is really addressing or, or more not kind of how awesome are the things that we've done over the last 15 years, but hey, are, 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 you, are you and me, are we basing our life on the, on the word of God? Are we doing simple stuff like that? Are we, are we living our lives based on the word of God? Is, is, is our life being based on what the culture says or is our life being based on what the word of God says? Is the, are, is the scripture our authority? We're gonna be talking about that next week, actually. Um, are you living in biblical community? That's what we're gonna be addressing today. Are you living in biblical community? Or are you kind of doing your own thing? Are you living your life on mission for God? Are you living your life? It, 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 when you get up in the morning, is one of kind of the first things you think about, how am I living my life in, in, in such a way that is helping fulfill the Great Commission today? Or are you living your life just for you, for, to, to fulfill the American dream, to make your existence comfortable for your family and to achieve success in this world? We wanna just simply go back to the basics and ask ourselves some of those difficult questions and see if we're actually living them out. All right, so uh, here's what I wanna do. I wanna, I wanna talk today about what it looks like for us to live in community. That's gonna be kind of the first core conviction that we're gonna look at. Um, we decided to start with community because next week I think is, not that community's not important, but we're gonna be talking about um, our conviction about basically living our lives according to scripture. And so that's next week. College students are coming back next week. We wanted them to be able to hear it. So we're starting talking about the conviction that we have to live in community. Now, again, here comes the second sports illustration and then we're done with sports for the, for the Sunday. Um, but, but here's the thing that I want you to understand about the Christian life. The Christian life was never meant to be lived in isolation. The, your walk with Christ was never meant to be walked out alone. If you think about Christianity in terms of a sport, it is a team sport. We, I, I, I have a tendency, a lot of times even me, I have, I, I have a hard time not thinking about my walk with Christ and turn more like a tennis match. 
it, it's me and I'm on one side of the net and then I got the enemy on the other side of the net and then, and then my walk with Christ is just this back and forth with the enemy and whether I win or whether I lose is dependent on how well I'm playing that day. But when you look at the Bible, when you look at what the scripture says about Christianity, about our faith, about our walk with Jesus, it's a lot more like a team sport. It's meant to be, biblically speaking, a group of people all on the field at the exact same time, all kind of playing and living out their individual roles, and you win or you lose depending on how well you stay together and play together, if you will, as a team. That's how Christianity is described, all right? And so what I wanna do is I'm gonna take a few minutes here and I just wanna walk through some biblical foundations of this idea that you and I are called to live in covenant community together, that we need to be committed to that as a church and as individuals. So 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 26. Let's look at that real quick. So this is Paul speaking here. He's talking to the church in Corinth. And I want you to watch and how he describes the church. When he's talking about us, and when he's talking about the church, he's talking about you and me as individuals that make up this group called the church. Now look at verse 26 and verse 27 and watch how he describes the church here. He says, if one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. Now look at verse 27 carefully. It says, now you are, everybody say that with me, the body. Let's do it again. You are You're the body. You're the body of Christ and individually members of it. And all through the Bible, the scripture refers to you and to me together as the body of Christ. And then it says, so that's who we are. We're a body together. And then individually, you are a member of that body. Body. Now that word member there doesn't mean like member of a country club, it's talking about a part. It's saying we're, we're the body of Christ and you individually as a, as a single person, you are a part, a member of that body of Christ. Now church, there's a reason. There's a reason that the word of God chose, or rather the Holy Spirit, when, when he was inspiring the word of God, there's a reason the Holy Spirit chose to use the body as one of the primary illustrations of the church. Another one's family, there's the bride, but one of the primary ones is body, and there's a reason that happened, and here's the reason. If you think about your body, everybody think about your body right now. You got a bunch of different parts of your body. You got eyes, you got, you got ears, nose, fingers, toes, you got heart, you got lungs, you got all these different distinct parts of your body and every single part of your body plays a different role. Every part of your body plays a different role. But here's the thing to remember, that even though you have all these different and distinct body parts, still just one body. All those individual parts make up a whole. And and guys, that is the picture that the Holy Spirit and the Bible paints of the church. That's the illustration, one of the primary illustrations that's used is that we have all these individual parts, but we're all working together and we are one. We are one body. Now here's a question for you. Well, hypothetical question, and don't try this at home. <clears throat> but what happens, what would happen rather, if you were to cut off or to re- remove or separate a part of your body? What, what happens to, to a part of your body if it were to be um, unattached from the rest of the body? Well, there's a couple of things that would happen if you removed a body part or cut it off. Number one is it would completely stop performing the function that it was created to perform. Y'all with me? If you cut off your hand, it's not gonna continue to function in the way that a hand was meant to function. It's not gonna you know, follow you around and, and, and keep writing for you or typing for you or, or picking up your phone for you. It's gonna stop performing the function it was created to perform. And here's the second thing that's gonna happen. If you were to cut off your hand, it's going to die. It's gonna die. In just a matter of minutes, it will stop performing the function and it will die. Now I want you to listen again to the verse, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 27. It says, now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. You play, if you're a Christian here today, you are part of the body of Christ, whether you think you are, whether you admit you are, whether you've ever thought about it before, you are a part, you are a member of that body. And there are many reasons 
that, that, that the Bible calls the church the body, but one of the main reasons I believe that we are called the body of Christ is to convey this, listen, that you simply will not survive. You simply will not survive unless you are attached to the rest of the body of Christ. If you separate yourself, if you separate yourself from the body of Christ, if you separate yourself from biblical community, if you isolate yourself from biblical community, it is simply a matter of time before you will stop performing your intended function that God created you to fulfill in the body, and it is also simply a matter of time until spiritually speaking, you will wither away and you will die. Okay, it's one of the, one of the main reasons <coughs> that the, that, um, being a part of the body, being a part of the church, living your life in the context of committed community is so absolutely critical as this. Is there, and I want you to hear this, if you take a note, this would be a good thing to write down, is, is there is, biblically speaking, protection that occurs inside the church, not inside the building, but inside the body. First Corinthians, Paul talks about this. There is a spirit, there's a certain spiritual level of protection that is afforded to you against um, spiritual attack, if you will, and it only occurs inside the body of Christ. And when you step apart from that, you're no longer there. You no longer have that, that protection. In First Corinthians, there was a guy that uh, Paul writes about that was, had fallen into some, some grievous sexual sin some grievous, unrepentant sexual sin. And when, when Paul is writing the church in Corinth about this guy, he instructs them, he says, I want you to remove him from the body. He says, I want you to remove him from the church. And when you, when you hear Paul say that, you think, well, was he doing that to punish the guy? Is he, is he being vindictive? He's not. Paul tells them why it's essential that he be removed from the body of Christ. Paul says, he does that, we should do that, so that Satan can destroy his flesh. Paul says, remove him from the church, and then when you remove him from the spiritual protection of the body of Christ, Satan is gonna have free reign on him, Satan will destroy his flesh, and maybe that will wake the guy up, and he'll repent, come back to the Lord, and his soul be saved in the day of judgment. It is crystal clear, there is a spiritual protection that's afforded to you inside the context of community that you do not experience outside of the context of community. And it makes sense when you think about it, <clears throat> when you think about what is Satan called in scripture? What is Satan called in scripture? He's called a, a very specific thing. He's, he's referenced quite often as a lion. And don't turn there, just watch this, First Peter 5, 8. Listen to what Peter, how Peter describes Satan. And this is kind of a verse that we hear a lot and kind of glaze over, but I want you to like lean in and really look at these words as, as Peter describes Satan in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, he says, be sober-minded, be watchful. He says, for your adversary, or your enemy, the devil, he prowls around. He prowls around. And so, so Peter's saying, hey, you need to understand something about Satan. He's moving, he, he's looking, he's active, he's on the hunt. He's prowling around, okay, that's the first thing he says. And then he says, what is he prowling around like? He says he's prowling around like a roaring lion. If you wanna know how Satan works, let's leave that up for a second. If you wanna know how Satan works, if you wanna know kind of how he interacts with you, he's, he's creeping around, he's looking around, and the way that he does that is like a lion. I don't know if you guys have ever watched Discovery Channel, but I, I watch it every once in a while. And uh, I've watched some of those shows where you see lions trying to, trying to get after animals and eat them and stuff. I don't know why people watch that stuff, but I, I watched it one day and there was this lion that was coming after, I, I, I don't know what, what's a group of elephants called? Anybody know? A herd. Okay, I don't know if it was a pack. I don't know, I don't know what it is. Anyway, a herd, I missed that in second grade. Um, it was a herd of elephants. And this lion decided one day that he was gonna, he was gonna eat one of these elephants. These elephants were smart. They got together. They kind of formed a circle. They even put their little baby elephants. What are baby elephants called? 
baby elephants. All right. Um, they, I, don't, I don't know if there's like a name for baby elephants, but I missed that in second grade. But they had, they put the baby elephants in the middle and they circled around. And every time this lion would kind of come in, they, they would just swat that thing with their trunks. And, and, and that lion, you could see it on his face. He was frustrated. I mean, all, on, all he wanted to do was just eat some lunch, but they just weren't letting him do it. And then, and then lo and behold, one of the elephants, just one of the little elephants, like an idiot, just boom, took off. Just took off for no reason. Just like, this dude's like, I'm out of here. And he took off. And the lion did not hesitate. One second, ignored the herd, and he went and killed the lion that had isolated, or not rather, rather the elephant rather, that had isolated himself from the herd. Now here's the thing. Listen again to this verse. Be sober-minded. Be watchful. For your adversary, the devil, he prowls around like this, like a roaring lion. Now look at the last part there. Seeking some one to devour. Seeking some one to devour. Who is Satan seeking? Who is he looking for? Who is he prowling around for to devour? That's a strong word. That doesn't mean attack. That doesn't mean play with. That doesn't mean mess with. He wants to eat you. He wants to destroy you. And who is it that he is looking to destroy? The scripture says some one. <laughs> Some one. He doesn't say he's seeking a group of people to destroy. He doesn't say he's looking for a church to destroy. He says he is looking for someone to destroy. I'm gonna give you guys a little, little hint about life. Satan is not in a hurry to take you out. He's not in a hurry to take you out. He's patient. I've seen it time and time and time again. He is patient and he waits and he watches and he waits until a believer, a Christian, isolates themselves from other Christians, isolates themselves from the body of Christ, removes themselves from community, and that is when he pounces. He is seeking someone to devour. Satan's trophy room is full of Christians that thought they could live the Christian life apart from community. And here's the thing, every, every single time, guys, that I have seen somebody walk away from the faith, and I've seen it a lot, every single time I've seen someone fall into grievous sin, every single solitary time, two things happen right before. Number one, they quit reading the Bible. That's, that's typically the first thing you see every single time as they step away from, from being in the word of God and, and that connection with God falls away. That's the first thing you see. And the other thing you see time after time after time again is you see them, for whatever reason, remove themselves from Christian community. And then when they, when they are removed from the Christian community, the protection is gone. Satan is no longer thwarted by that protection. He sees them. Instead of being a we, they become an I, and he, and he pounces and he takes them out. Okay, nobody starts off. If you're, if you're walking with Christ here, there's, there's not a person in this room or in the sound of my voice that's, that's walking with Jesus that thinks in the back of their mind, yeah, one day I'm gonna fall. There's not a person in this room that's walking with Jesus that thinks, yeah, I'm capable of walking away from the faith. I'm capable of, of falling into some crazy, grievous sin. You don't think that, but I'm gonna tell you, it happens all the time. It happens in our church all the time. And again, every single time it happens when they walk away from the word and when people walk away from community. If you're here today and you are isolated from real Christian community, if you're here today and you would call yourself a Christian, but you are isolated from the church, if you're isolated from the body of Christ, if you're showing up on Sunday and then just living your life completely separate from Christian community, I want you to understand something. You are just waving a red flag at Satan saying, hey, free game here, big fat target on my chest, come and take me out. And it's usually just a matter of time before it happens. You and I are the body of Christ, you are a member of it. That is where the Christian life is meant to be lived inside the body and the body alone. Second biblical foundation, turn quickly, Acts chapter two, verse 41. Acts chapter two, verse 41. 
Let's go ahead and bring that up on the screen. <coughs> this is um, the book of Acts. Luke is writing. He's describing the early church. Okay, and so Pentecost has happened. The Holy Spirit of God has fallen on the people. They're now filled with the Spirit, and then the church began to function as a church. And so these are the early days of the church functioning as a church, and I want you to, to look at a couple things here with me. In Acts chapter two, verse 41, <clears throat> Luke writes, he says, so those who received his word were baptized, that's Peter, received his word, were baptized, and they were added that day about 3,000 souls, and so the church began right there. 3,000 people got saved, the church was formed. This is after the resurrection and ascension of Christ. In verse 42, <coughs> this, is, this is what they were doing as a church in the early days. This is they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship and to the breaking of bread and prayers. And so once every, all these people got saved, the Holy Spirit fell, they started acting and behaving as a church. It said they devoted themselves to a few things. The apostles' teaching, it was the preaching and the teaching of the apostles, the word of God. And the second thing it says they devoted themselves to was the fellowship. Now what does that mean? That's a phrase that carries with it the idea of community. It's not talking about potluck suppers in the fellowship hall like I had growing up, which were awesome and we need to bring them back, amen? But it was more than that. It was more than that, it's a word that means social togetherness. It's a word that means a, a moving forward of life in the context of togetherness and community. And so, well, so what didn't happen when the Holy Spirit fell and the church began, what didn't happen is, is each individual person or each individual family thought, all right, that's cool, I got the Holy Spirit now, um, I'm gonna show up to a building on Sunday, I'm gonna worship through a few songs, hear a sermon, and then go live my life. It's not what happened. It's a phrase that means this early church, they were devoted, they were absolutely committed to this concept of, of living out their walks with Jesus together arm in arm. That's what it means. <clears throat> now, there's a couple things I want you to see here. Number one, look at the verse again and, and pay attention to the word devoted. Pay attention to the word devoted. Okay, it's a word, it, it doesn't mean that they were just casually interested in community. Peter didn't preach a sermon on community and they thought, eh, you know, I'm, I might ought to do that. This is a young church that was not sort of inclined to community. That hey, we're, we're gonna do this some, but it's not convenient, we won't. This was a young church that was, um, was not part of Christian community when it was convenient to them. The Bible says they were devoted to it. They were devoted to it. It was an active, everyday part of their commitment to Jesus. It's, it, it's a word that means to engage with endurance. It was something they were thinking about. It was something they were committed to. They said, look, this idea of living the Christian faith and life together, this is a big deal, and we're gonna be committed to it in our lives. We're gonna devote ourselves to it. Now, you know why I think that's really important? That you know why that's something I believe as a church, a couple thousand years later, that we need to start modeling? is because what I found is that living in Christian community is not easy. It ain't easy. It's one of those things when you hear it, it sounds really cool and it sounds really wonderful, but then when you do it, you realize this is a lot harder than I thought. Um, there's a lot of you in the room that are a part of a little Christian community, it's called marriage. And, and that's a little microcosm of Christian community. How easy is that? It ain't easy. And the same is true for church. When you make the commitment, when you're devoted, you know, okay, okay I'm, I'm not gonna do this thing alone. I'm gonna get some people around me and, and we're gonna do this thing together. That is not the easiest thing in the world to do. I hear, I've heard all kinds of excuses <coughs> over the years when, when I've watched as people that began strong in this were no longer devoted to it and they give reasons like these are real reasons um, that I've heard over the years. People bail from, from the fellowship, from church, I'm talking about the body, not from attendance. I'm talking about being in the body, Christian community, because they got tired of being challenged on their sin. I've heard that so many times over the years. People are just honest with me. They leave the church, and I find out they didn't like go down the street to another church. They're just not going at all. And, and people say to me, Matt, you know, here's the thing about the Austin Stone. I found is that it's not easy just to sit in a chair and live your life any way you want to live at this church. Usually, you either change or you leave, and I just decided I needed to leave because I got tired of being convicted. 
and you start digging, is that because of the sermons? That's part of it. Is it because of the music? That's part of it. Is because of the Holy Spirit that's in the church? That's part of it. But it's also because there were people that were in their lives that were tapping this guy on the shoulder and saying, hey, man, I see the way that you're living. I see what you're doing. And, and I don't know if that's what God wants for you. And people just like, you know what? I don't know if I'm into all that holiness stuff. And so they leave. People grow tired of being pressed into on areas of weakness in their life, whether it be you know, their addictions, whether it be generosity, whether it be their marriage, they get tired of it, they leave. Uh, I've seen people grow weary of bearing one another's burdens. They grow tired of it and they need a break. And so they disengage from community. Community's hard. There are people that are gonna be in your circle of influence that, that, that go through seasons of their life and they're needy. They're gonna suck the life out of you. And I can't tell you how many times I've seen where, where a community, a group of people, they, they hit a rough spot, they hit a, and, and it just gets too hard and people need a break. They wanna in, disengage from it and just go on with their lives and so they leave community. I've seen people disengage from community because their kids get in a life stage where Christian community becomes really difficult, whether it be because it requires babysitting or whether your kids are in some sports program and it just becomes inconvenient to live in the context of Christian community so they become Sunday attenders and that's, that's it. Um, I've seen people become successful in their jobs. They make a lot of money, they buy a lake house and then all of a sudden going out with the family to the lake house becomes a lot more important than engaging in the life of the local church and the body of Christ. Being devoted to a fellowship is not easy. It takes commitment, even when it's really hard. I, I, I had a decision this week where I, I, I consciously thought to myself, I don't wanna do this, but I'm gonna do it because one, I'm preaching about it on Sunday and I don't wanna be a hypocrite, and two, because I really believe this is biblically what I'm supposed to do. Tuesday night, Kevin Peck, our lead pastor, he, he, had, he had all the elders over at his house. It was at six o'clock in the evening and that's during rush hour. I don't know if you knew that here in Austin because traffic's just amazing in this town. It's so easy to drive around at six o'clock. Now I live in way southwest Austin, out you know where the Salt Lake is. I live out by Salt Lake and Kevin lives kind of in northwest central Austin and it's and at five o'clock when you need to start driving, it takes a long time to get to Kevin's house from my house. It took me an hour and 20 minutes. Now at, at, at 4.40 when I knew it was about time for us to leave, the last thing in the world I wanted to do after a long day of work is get in the car and drive an hour and 20 minutes to go eat dinner in Northwest Central Austin. But I thought, man, you know, I need to do this. This is my community. The senior staff, the elders, this is my biblical community. These are the people that I am walking out my Christian faith with. I need to be devoted to it. And so I got in the car and I did it and the drive stunk. But when I got there, I'm so glad that I stayed. I'm so glad that I got in the car and did it. I mean, I was immediately, I was hugged by all these elders. They're asking me, man, how you been? What, what have you been up to? Um, asking me about, you know, I had, I had a guy ask me about my marriage. I had a guy ask me about my summer. I had a guy ask me about my book. I had a guy ask me about my prayer life. I had a guy ask me about some stuff I'd ask him to keep me accountable on. This is all in the course of about an hour. And then even better than that, we got around and all of us just began to pray. For about an hour, we all got in little groups and we prayed together. We prayed for you specifically. We prayed for our church as a whole. We prayed for this series. We prayed that the spirit would fall. And then we prayed for each other. And there was just kind of a moment where we had this kind of sweet moment where we were just getting vulnerable with each other and, and we were crying and it was just an unbelievable time and I walked away from this little moment of Christian community realizing this is what it's supposed to look like. This is how I was, this is how I've been created to live out my walk with Jesus. I think we've gotten a really bad habit in, in American Christianity that we, we pursue biblical community when it's convenient for us. I think even as a church, we've got a ton of folks, man, that, that are coming and they're gathering on Sunday for worship. But I'm not quite sure if that's being translated out, that following step, to being devoted to the fellowship. The Bible's crystal clear. You are meant to live this out and do it together. Now, <clears throat> we're almost done here, but I wanna read through Acts 4, uh, excuse me, Acts 42 through 47, 242 through 47 real quick. Let's go ahead and bring this up. And I want, I want you to do something here. We're almost done. But I, as I read through this, as it's describing the early church, I want you to pay attention to how many times this early church is being referenced and living out their Christian faith together. Pay attention to that. In verse 42, it says, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, there's that word, and to the breaking of bread. The breaking of bread, 
There's some debate on what that means. Maybe that's communion. Maybe that's dinner. Maybe it's both. We're not sure. But they're breaking the bread together there and in prayers. And an awe came upon every soul. And many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together. And they had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all, as many had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved, all right? And so there's, so there's churches together, the Spirit's fallen, they're doing all these things, and there was a couple of results that happened of this church and all the stuff they were doing. And here's the couple thing the Bible just said happened as a result of this church living out what they were doing. Number one, the scripture said, I love this, it says that there was a sense of awe that fell upon the church. I don't know what that means. I don't know what all that looked like, but, but Luke is trying to write it down. He's like, how can I articulate this? But there was a sense of awe that fell on every soul in the church. There, there was not passive worshipers there. There were not this group of people that came and just were just interested and went in and out. It's there, there were, the spirit was moving in such power in this early church that it all fell upon him. I, and, and, and I don't know what that means, but that, that sounds really cool. And the second thing it says is that they were growing like crazy. That there were people that were getting saved every single day in their church. That, that day after day after day, people were getting saved. It was because they were going out there and like, man, you gotta, you gotta come check this out. I don't know what's happening, but, but God is moving and I want you to come see it. And so come. And they came and, the, and they experienced the awe in every single day of their church. There were new people that were coming to Christ. And I don't know about you, but I'd love to be a part of a church like that. Amen? Where you walk into the fellowship and, and you don't know what it is, you can't explain it, but the Holy Spirit's so thick, you gotta brush him away with your fa- you know, from, from your face. And that when you're sitting in the row, you're not thinking about all the stuff that's going on in your life, you're not thinking about all the stuff you gotta get done when you leave church, you're not thinking about where you're going to lunch because there is such an awe of the living God that's fallen on you and me. And then every day we hear about, hey, so-and-so's friend, he trusted in Christ. So-and-so's brother, he came, he trusted in Christ. So-and-so's uh, son, he, he came, he, he trusted in Christ. I wanna be a part of a church like that. But here's what I want you to hear, and I want you to hear this very carefully. <clears throat> in describing the practices of the church in Acts chapter two there, when Luke was writing all the stuff that they did, where this all fell in the church and all these people were getting saved, here's a question. How many times was prayer mentioned in that list? Once. How many times was preaching mentioned in that list? Once. How many times was worship mentioned, or singing rather, mentioned in that list? Once. How many times was the concept of biblical community mentioned in that list? At least four, arguably five times. Now I wanna be real clear on this. You cannot have church, you cannot have biblical community apart from prayer, you can't have it apart from preaching. It's biblical, you can't have it apart from worship. It's incredibly biblical. So that's not what I'm saying. What I am saying is this, is when you look at the scripture, we realize this truth right here, this is it. You and I were never, ever, ever, ever meant to live out our Christian faith alone and there is power that is found in the together. There's power in it. Now, I wanna end today by just really quickly asking you some questions and just get you to evaluate whether or not you're actually in Christian community. Just three, three quick questions, we're done. You just asking yourself the question, am I really in it? Because I think there are a lot of us, if we were to ask that question, am I living in Christian community? You might say you are, but maybe you're really not. And so here's some ways to know. <clears throat> Do you have people in your life? Here's the first question. Do you have people in your life in addition to your spouse that have permission and proximity to challenge you on your sin and your weaknesses in your walk with Christ? Do you have people that are in your life that have, that have permission and proximity to challenge you on your sin? Now those two words are key. 
permission and proximity. Because I've seen a lot of guys that have given other men permission to challenge them on their sin, but those men that they'd given permission to didn't have proximity to them. I have a, um, a buddy of mine that got in some real bad stuff and uh, was a pastor and lost his job. And he would tell you he had given permission to guys to challenge him on his sin, but like one of those guys was me and he's in a whole nother town in a whole nother state. And he, he had given some permission to other pastors around the nation to challenge him on his sin, but he had never given permission to people that were right around him, that had proximity to him to challenge him on his sin. And so he had the sin in his life that went unchecked, was never challenged. So he would say, yeah, I'm living in Christian community, but he absolutely was not living in Christian community. At the very same time, I've seen men and women that actually, um, they've actually got people that live in, or Christians rather, that live in close proximity to them, but they've never actually given them permission to challenge them. I see that probably more often. As you go, are you living in Christian community? Yeah, because you've got Christians around you, but you've never sat somebody down that was a peer and say, hey, I want you to understand something. You have absolute permission that if you see sin in my life, if you see areas where I'm straight in my life, you sit me down and you challenge me and I will receive it with humility. A lot of people don't give permission. And so you have to have, are, are you living in Christian community? Ask yourself the question. <clears throat> are there people that are in my life that I've given permission to and they're close to me to challenge me and press into my life? That's number one. Here's the second one. Do you have people in your life that, that you know beyond a shadow of a doubt and I call this, I call, I call it this, that, that are 3 a.m. friendships. Do you have 3 a.m. friendships in your life? Do you have people that, beyond a shadow of a doubt, no question in your mind, that if you called them at 3 a.m. in the morning and say, I need you to come right now, they would come. They'd drop everything. And do you have people in your life that you would do that for also? Because community is never a one-way street. It's always a two-way street. Do you, because... Do you, the Christian life is not just about having these kind of accountable relationships that, that are there to pound you when you mess up. It's also about real, authentic, beautiful friendship. It's about friendship. Um, there was a woman that I heard speak at, um, and I've spoken with at a few conferences named Rosaria Butterfield. And if you've never heard her preach or speak, you need to. You need to. She's amazing. She, uh, she's brilliant. One of the smartest people I've ever been around. And um, she, before she came to Christ, she lived in the LGBT lifestyle and she became a Christian, she came to Christ and she turned from that lifestyle and she got married to a man. And um, she said that the number one struggle that she dealt with after she came to Christ, became a believer and a follower of Christ when, and she left the lifestyle, she says it wasn't sexual temptation, that was not her number one struggle. She said it was loneliness, it was loneliness. And she made a statement one time that she, she just stuck with me. She said, she said the thing that, that evangelical Christians need to know is that the LGBT um, community has exactly that. They have community. And, and they have beautiful friendships together and they live life together because so many of them have been isolated and so they've learned to love each other well. And she said, when I came to Jesus I was excluded from that community, so I no longer had that community that I was a part of. And she said the second thing, and this is what just uh, stuck me, she said the second thing I learned very, very quickly is that the vast majority of Christians in America live siloed and isolated lives. She said, I spent a huge number of months in my life in just utter loneliness because of the lack of Christian community that I had when I came to Jesus. Do you have people in your life that are deep, that, that you, with them you have deep, meaningful, loving, enduring friendship with? Okay, I think that's a critical question. And then lastly, do those people that are those 3 a.m. kind of friendships, are those people that are the 3 a.m. friendships, when you're around them, this is how you know if you have real biblical community, when you're around them, do they make you wanna be more like Jesus? Because I think it's entirely possible to have people that you're close to, to have people that would come at 3 a.m. in the morning, but, but when you're around them on a, on a consistent basis, they're not necessarily moving you towards a greater and deeper love for your Savior. 
I think real Christian community is not only having people that are close to you, that, that have proximity to you, that, that you've given permission to to speak into your life, that they're actual genuine friends with you, but when you get around them, they're like, man, that guy makes me want to know and to love and follow Jesus more. I don't, ha- I don't make close friends very easily. I'm an introvert, I got issues, and so I don't make close friendships very easily, but I've got about five or six guys in my life that I think fit all these categories. That I could probably honestly say I'm, I'm living out Christian community with the 3 a.m. in the morning kind of friendships. And if you line them all up, all five or six of them, if you line them up all beside each other, there is only one thing that all of them have in common. There's only one thing that they all have in common. They're not all rednecks, I promise you that. One of them sitting right here in the front row, brother, is not a redneck. His name's Aaron Ivey. They're not all rednecks. They're not all pastors. They're not all athletes. They're not all hunters. They're not all white. But there's one thing that every single one of them has in common, and that's every single one of them is deeply committed to Matt Carter walking with Jesus Christ and in finishing the race well. And I am deeply committed to them walking with Jesus Christ and them finishing the race well. This is what community looks like. Proximity and permission of people to challenge you in your sin and your walk with Jesus. Real, authentic, deep friendships that when you get around them, they make you want to love Jesus more and the fact that you're doing life together with them. Do you have those things? If you don't, now's the time to change them. Now's the time to change them. If you don't have it today, I want you to pray for it. That's what you start praying for. You pray for it, ask God for it every day until he gives it to you, until you fight for it. It's not always gonna be easy. It's not always gonna happen overnight. Keep fighting, be devoted to it, and you do not stop until you have it, all right? Let's pray together as a church, come on. Father, we love you. Father, if there are any in this room that, that today probably realize, you know, I, that's me. I've been, coming to, I've been coming to church. I've been coming to uh, worship. That's really where it's ending. Lord, I pray that by your spirit that you would give them a passion to reach out. And Father, I pray that you would bless them with friendships with community, with people in their lives, God, that would come around them and hold up their arms and help them endure to the end. Father, I pray for for this church when it gets frustrating, when it gets wearisome, when it gets tiring, when it doesn't seem to be coming together. Um, For those that are in community right now, they're in difficult community, Lord, I pray that you would help them see the value in it and I pray that you would help them endure in it. Lord, protect us from the enemy in a culture where the enemy is prowling. May we stand firm against him. The word promises he will not win. Pray that that would be true in our lives, Lord. We love you, we praise you, we worship you today, Jesus. We give you the glory for everything that you've done in us and through us. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray, amen. Amen, church, let's stand together.